Family Theatre presents Hildegard and Phil Carey. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theatre, presents Follow Me, starring Phil Carey. And now, here is your hostess, Hildegard. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family theater urges you to pray, pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, Follow Me, starring Phil Carey as Gino and featuring John Stevenson as Phil. Like a lot of people, I, uh, I used to be in the Army. And like a lot of other people, I learned a lot of things. I met a lot of people and I brought back some interesting memories. The one I'd like to tell you about is of a man, a second lieutenant whom I'll call Philip Bailey. It's pretty close to the man's real name. You see, he might not like me using his real name because... Well, because of the nature of his problem. He thought he was a coward, and I suppose, in a manner of speaking, he was. I was one of the few people who really knew the lieutenant, in the Army, that is. I mean, one of the few he'd really talked to about himself. We were stateside when we first met. In fact, we were both in a training company. I, a trainee, while the lieutenant was one of the officers in charge of training. My first impression of Lieutenant Bailey was a pretty good one. In fact, he made a considerable number of friends the first time he appeared before the trainees. I remember we hadn't been in the Army more than a few days, and most of us had formed a scraggly line in front of the mail window of the orderly room, waiting for the first company mail call. Corporal Curtin, the mail clerk, was giving everybody a bad time before handing out any mail. Now form an orderly line in front of this mail window. Come on, form up! You guys are too stupid to be soldiers. Now, if you people don't form up faster after this, there ain't gonna be no mail call. Come on, come on. The reason I'm letting you get away with it this time is there's a lot of mail here. There's a lot of packages I want to have a lot of room in this mail room to move around in. But in the future, none of you guys is getting away with nothing, you understand? Is that understood? I say, is that understood? I'll tell you what I want you people to do. Yeah. As you step up to this here window, do it in an orderly fashion. And I want to see you move up here like a lot of sloppy tramps that you are. And when you get here, sing out your name loud and clear. Understand? Loud and clear. And after that, don't say nothing less spoken to you. Understand? All right, now. What's your name? Lang. My name's Lang. I'm uh, Connie expecting a package. Oh, you better pay attention, Lang. I said just your name. I don't want no song and dance about your kind of expecting. Well, all I, said. I know what you said. And look, Lang, in case you don't know it, these two stripes here mean I'm a corporal. You want trouble, I can give you plenty of it. You understand? Understand? Yes. Yes what? Yes, I understand. We'll see you do. Now, Lang, you got a first name? Alan C. All right. Next time you come to this here window, you better know how to act, Alan C. All right. You get a package. And a couple of letters. All right, next. Come on, name, name. What's your name? Wong, George. You hear what I just told you of these men? Yes, sir. Wong, huh? You expect the mail from China? From L.A. Well, you don't look like you're from L.A. to me. You're a Chinaman, ain't you? We've been a long time from China. I'm an American. If you're in doubt again during the next two years, I'll be wearing this uniform, which I've been told is of the Army of the United States, and labels me better for what I am than either my face or my name. You're getting pretty sarcastic, aren't you, Private Wong? I just think I'll make an example out of you. That's about enough out of you, Kurt. Who said that? Who spoke out of turn? I did. Philip Bailey. Mom, just passing out the mail, sir. Pardon me, soldier. Yes, sir. Let me through, please. Now, I've been listening to you, Corporal. Me, sir? You ever hear of human dignity, Curtin? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, I have. Well, I don't believe you. 
But in the off chance someone may define it for you sometime, these men are entitled to keep theirs. Yes, sir. These gentlemen are new in the Army. You. Oh, yes, sir. How long have you been in the Army? Uh, four days, sir. You think this little man up here in the mailroom window is typical of the Army? I, uh, I haven't been in there long enough to know. Private Wong? Sir? How do you feel about it? Must not be, sir. Why do you say that? Well, if he was, sir, we'd never win any wars. <laughs> you hear that, Curtin? Yes, sir. You're just not impressing these men the way you think you are. Apparently, being intelligent individuals, they're not thinking of you as a tough soldier. In fact, they're probably thinking of you as just a big mouth punk. I'm uh, just doing my job, sir. Well, do it. You're the mail clerk. The fact that you're a corporal is incidental. I'm in charge of training. If there's any shouting or bawling out to be done, I'll do it when and if it's indicated. You just hand out the mail, and you better do it well. If every man in this company hasn't called for his mail inside of a half hour, I'll back you down to a PFC, understand? But well, don't nod your head and pout at me. I said, do you understand? Yes, sir. All right, get to work. All right, who's next? Weldon, Gino. I meant what I said, Curtin. Yes, sir. What was that name again, sir? Name's Weldon, Gino F., and uh, you can uh, call me private. All right, all right, all right. Three letters, one newspaper. Who's next? Who's next? Like I said, the first impression of the lieutenant was a pretty good one. We all saw him as well as a fair man with a sense of humor and a sense of justice. It wasn't until about the 13th week of training that I heard about his fear. I was assigned as runner for CQ or charge of quarters. I was sitting in the orderly room when he came in and started to talk. He looked tired and worried, but it didn't look like it was from the kind of fatigue that would let him go to sleep. They were showing us everything the army had for the infantry soldier to use in combat. You know, that's when it hit me. You see, for 30 seconds, they fired all the weapons they had at a hill a quarter mile away. And it occurred to me that that stuff could go both ways. You know what I mean? The enemy might be able to throw that much stuff at a hill I was on. Wait. Listen. Hmm? Open the window. Oh, yes, sir. Now, listen. That's a beautiful call. Tattoo? Like it? Yeah, it's, it's kind of pretty, sir. It's my favorite, Trooper. That's the one that says, relax. The day's work is done. That's music. Yes, sir. So you're a trainee, aren't you? That, that's right, sir. Charge of quarters is an NCO job. They assigned it to you? No, sir. I'm, I'm just a CQ runner. Well, I've been here ten minutes now, and I haven't seen any CQ. Who is he? A Corporal Curtin, sir. Ah, that one. Why is he sacked out? Sacked out? Don't worry, I'm not going to make trouble for anybody, but I know Curtin. He's the greatest sack artist in the business. Well, sir, there, there's nothing left to do anyway. Uh-huh. I bet if I walked over and pushed the door to the captain's office open a little wider, I'd find him flaked out on the captain's couch. Am I right? Well, sir... You better answer me. Hell hath no fury like a second lieutenant unanswered, you know. Yes, sir, he's in there. That guy's a real punk. He's the pattern along whose lines all true punks are designed. I bet he made you do all his work tonight. Did he? Well, well, some of it, sir. <sighs> well, maybe it's for the best. I don't think he's smart enough to do it himself. At least the odds are about six to one the CQ duties are done right tonight. Oh, thank you, sir. Your name's uh, Weldon, isn't it? And the first name... Uh, wait a minute, don't tell me. It's uh, uh, Genio or something like that. Gino. That's right, Gino. 
Well, Gina, you'd better be careful. Careful, sir? Yeah, careful. And uh, stop calling me sir for a while, will you? I mean, for now. Okay. Well, why should I be careful? You're a smart boy, that's why. What happened to me could happen to you. What's that, sir? Uh-uh. Uh -huh. uh. <laughs> All right. Uh, what is it could happen to me? You could be a second John. A second lieutenant? Me? Sure. I was a pretty smart boy, and they noticed me. And some busybody took a look at the grade I got in officer candidate test, and I got invited to go to OCS. Yeah? And I bit. Ah, the visions that floated through my head. Officer and gentleman in a sharp uniform with lots and lots of chrome. People saluting. Being able to shout back at sergeants. And the things that the people back home would say. Did you hear Philip Bailey's an officer now? Oh, did I bite. Well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with it? Gino Weldon, you're looking at a dead man. Huh? This company's been training for 13 weeks. In three more weeks, we'll all get shipped right smack dab into the middle of the Korean War. But still, that doesn't... I'll tell you what it means for me. What? I'll tell you what it can mean for almost any second lieutenant of infantry. So you won't make the same mistake I did when I volunteered for this job. You happen to read Stan Delaplane on the San Francisco paper a couple of days ago? Are you kidding, sir? Uh, I guess a trainee doesn't have much time for reading. But anyhow, in his column, he outlined the uses to which second Johns are put. I could have written that column. What use? To lead. Yeah, it's as simple as that. To lead. So? He's a guy who's always hollering, come on, man, follow me. Now, you're a smart guy, Gina. When a man says, follow me, where must he be? Why, in front. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. Get the picture? The landing barge pulls up the beach and the ramp comes down. Who gets off first? Second John. Right. All the other men on the barge remember their manners and let the second John off first. Then they watch him walk around gingerly on the beach shouting, follow me. And after a few seconds, if aforementioned second John hasn't exploded, they follow him. Now don't get me wrong, Gino. I'm not talking about just this army, the U.S. Army in particular. I'm talking about all armies. They've all got second lieutenants of infantry who specialize in looking brave while they go first. First off the landing barges, first into the minefield, first up the hill that has to be taken. Well, sir, if that were true, there, there wouldn't be any men going OCS. There are two things not to be in wartime, Gino. One is on point, and the other is a combat second. I'm as good as dead, boy. I, I think you're wrong, Lieutenant. I, uh... I think you're borrowing trouble. Oh, you think so. Well, like you said, I'm a pretty smart boy. <laughs> yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I've been talking through my small brass hat. Maybe I'm drunk with fatigue, but I know one thing, Gino. I know one thing. What's that? Will you keep it just between us? I mean, if the men know how to get... I mean, between us. If you want me to. You believe in premonitions? No. Well, I do. I've got one. I know I'm not coming out of this war alive. You know something else? What? I got a big fear, a really big fear. I'm afraid I'll panic in battle. Oh, I don't. No, I mean it. That's why I know I'm not coming back. In that minute, the minute of panic when fear takes over, that's when, when you do the stupid thing that kills you. <sighs> Why am I telling you all this? Some, sometimes it helps to talk things out. You're a good kid, Gino. <laughs> kid. I bet you're older than I am. Ah, it's a crazy war. And about this panic, it probably won't happen. Why don't, why don't you stop thinking about it? Some things you can't just stop thinking about. This is like... Like a private knowledge. Know what I mean? I think so. Can't stop thinking about it. It's with me all the time. It scares the daylights out of me. Listen. There's the one I like best. Not me. Close the window, will you? Close it. Sure, if you say so, but... But that's lights out. All it means is go to bed. Yeah, I know. 
Maybe it's the connotation or something. They played at funerals. The lieutenant went to the BOQ shortly after, and for a minute or two, I just sat there in the half light of the writing lamp on the first sergeant's desk. Then I walked over to the door of the captain's office and looked in at Corporal Curtin. You got something on your mind, Private? Uh, I'm sorry. I, uh, I thought you were asleep. Well, you wasn't the only one. You heard what the lieutenant said, Corporal? I heard it. I heard every cut and picking word. I heard that fathead call me a punk. And something else, Private. I heard you agree with him. Then you didn't hear right. You calling me a liar. Did you hear the rest of what he had to say? You know, you're getting pretty big for your britches for a trainee, ain't you, Weldon? I just want to know, that's all. I heard him admit he's yellow, if that's what you mean. <sighs> Says he's afraid all the time. <laughs> he calls me a punk. Boy. You're going to keep it to yourself, aren't you, Corporal? Keep it to myself? Oh, that's a lie. Well, what good's it going to do you? Nobody calls me a punk. Nobody. What's the matter, Weldon? What do you, what do you think? He's your buddy now or something? No, I don't think that. Just because he cries on your shoulder, you think... Just a minute. Don't you shout at me. I'll have you scrubbing garbage cans for the rest of your stay in this army if you don't start to shape up. One thing you better learn, There are a few things you better learn. Oh, you're looking for trouble, huh? Everybody in this company likes that officer. He works harder than we do and sees we get what's coming to us, and he treats us like human beings, which is more than I can say for you. You betray that guy, and you'll have everybody in the company down on you. Because I'll make sure everybody knows who betrayed him. I promise you that. And I'll tell you another thing. You're not going to tell anybody anything. Are you trying to tell me what to do? I am telling you what to do. It doesn't matter to me if I get stockade time. You say one word, and I'll break every bone in your head, punk. It was about two weeks later when the next incident occurred. The whole company was in a week's bivouac. It was just another way of saying living out in the woods. It was child time. We were all standing in line waiting for the cook to start dishing out the food. We're not what you call in the best of spirits. You people look a little unhappy. Like maybe you don't like shaving in cold water or something. Anybody got any complaints? Oh, I'll listen to any reasonable complaints. I can't guarantee that I'll do anything about them, but I'll listen. Robert Lang, you don't look too happy. Oh, I'm, I'm happy enough, sir. Aside from the scratch, that is. The scratch? <laughs> That's right, sir. I'm, I'm having to itch all the time. I, I think maybe it's the dirt. <laughs> now, you don't like sporting eight days worth of dirt, eh? Well, don't know so much if it's the dirt, sir. It's uh, maybe some varmints have found it deep enough to live in. <laughs> <laughs> and you, Private Weldon? Oh, uh, sir. <laughs> Weldon, that's the worst-looking shave I ever saw. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not easy in the cold water, sir. Oh, I can do it. How do you like the shave I've got? <laughs> well, sir, uh, it's, it's... Never mind. We better not go into that. All right, men, this group right here, from Private Wong through Private Weldon. Now, that includes you, Corporal Curtin. Stay in the line. Mess kit inspection. Mess kit inspection? <laughs> Since you're all standing in the chow line, let's hope your mess kits are all clean enough to eat out of. Wong, your mess kit. Right here, sir. <laughs> now, look at that canteen cup, will you? Wong, you come from Los Angeles? That's right, sir. <laughs> Where they grow oranges? <laughs> yes, sir. With smudge pots? Yes, sir. Private Wong, have you been using your canteen cup for smudge pot practice? <laughs> no, sir. No. Cup's filthy. You're hereby disqualified from inspection. Get back in the chow line. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, then, this your mess kit? Uh, yes, sir. You've been cleaning your rifle with this fork? <laughs> no, sir. Well, how do you account for the fact that there is a prong missing? A prong missing? Right there. Well, this fork has only four prongs. It's only, only supposed to have four, sir. <laughs> uh, Private Wong, show this man your fork. Right here, sir. Wong, you also have a prong missing. <laughs> Lang. Hey, you call me, sir? How many prongs have you in your fork? Why, well, I see here, uh, uh, one, two, it's a four, sir. <laughs> well, here's your kit, Weldon. It really needs one more prong, but in the interest of uniformity, I don't want you putting any more prongs in that fork. Understand, Weldon? Aha! <laughs> uh -huh. Corporal Curtin. Great Scott. 
This mess kit is terrible. Worst looking thing I ever saw. And will you look at that canteen cup? What's wrong with it? What's wrong? Corporal, you're supposed to set an example for these men. What's wrong? Well, the inside of that canteen cup looks like a swamp. Wait. There is not only dirt in the cup. I can see alligator tracks in the dirt. Oh, this is disgraceful. All right, that's enough. Huh? Maybe I don't keep it as clean as I ought to, but... But you're not... Not what, Curtin? This is only a sham inspection, Curtin. Just killing time till the child's ready. Let's finish what you were going to say. Nothing. Finish it! My mess kit may be dirty. But at least I'm not yellow. I warned you. Now leave him alone, Weldon. Get back. I can handle this. Now, Corporal. What did you mean by that remark? I'm just saying what you said yourself. And what did I say myself? That you're yellow. You're afraid all the time. You're afraid you'll get killed. That's enough. And it's your panic in combat. That's what you said. Not to you. Maybe I said it, but not to you. You've got an awful big mouth, Curtin. Big ears, too. All right, man. I said these things, all right. And when I said them, I believed them. It was the feeling I had, but I don't know whether it was right or wrong. Well, gentlemen, there's only one way to find out. And we'll all find out in a few weeks. But we didn't find out in a few weeks. You see, only about two squads of the original company reached the front lines together. The rest were pulled out to replace individuals who had been rotated in other outfits along the way. The lieutenant got assigned to an assault company that needed a combat officer, while I was sent to the next company down the line. I was on the line for 31 days, but I never could get any information about the lieutenant. In the first place, at times, it's the hardest thing in the world for a combat soldier to get information about the men in his own company who might have dug in maybe 200 yards away. To get information about another company, well, that's, that's pretty close to impossible. But there was one thing everybody heard about. The ceasefire. Man, this is all right. I kind of like it. What's that? Well, it's being upright. <laughs> well, now, don't laugh, man. Time where I wondered if I'd ever be able to stand up again without getting shot at. Yes, sir, I kind of like it. I, uh, I think I'll take me a little walk. A walk? I want to go over and see if the lieutenant made it. Lieutenant? What lieutenant? Well, you remember. Phil Bailey. Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, give him a hello for me, will you? Sure thing. And, uh, Weldon? Yeah? If he made it, Tell him I told him so, you hear? <laughs> I will. I found him a couple of miles behind the lines. He was in an aid station, flat in his back with one leg on an attraction splint. <laughs> hey, uh, understand you're still alive. It's Gino. Doc said I could drop in and say hello. Uh, that's about all I'm good for, I think. Sleeping pill. Yeah, yeah. The, the doc told me he had to give you something. Hurt much? I don't even know I've got it. <laughs> I'm so doped up, I didn't even feel my hand when you shook it. They tell you what happened? Somebody, somebody said you were a direct hit. Dud mortar round. Funny what can happen. Had my name on it. But it had a faulty fuse. Faulty fuse. I hear for the past month you you covered yourself with glory. Ah. Nah. Guess I made out. Had to. Funny what you can do when you have to. My number and a bad fuse. <laughs> bad. Phil? Phil? Hey, Doc. Yep. Uh, the lieutenant. Oh. Uh, asleep. He's under pretty heavy sedation. That leg of his is pretty badly broken. They told me at his outfit he, he ran into the middle of a mortar pattern to save some corporal. Uh, the man's name, it, uh, was it Curtin? Uh, 
No. No, it was Alvarez. Yeah, that's it, Alvarez. That didn't figure anyway. You know something, Doc? What? This guy thinks he's a coward. He was sure he'd panic in battle. Well, most people do. To a degree, at least. In his first combat, your friend did panic. He told me all about it the first time he was in here a month ago. He got up in complete, unreasoning panic like a man possessed, and his whole platoon followed him. He ran? That one time. Ever since, he's had to work and fight twice as hard to live up to what his men expect of him. You see, in his panic and confusion, he ran the wrong way. He ran right into the battle. This is Hildegard again. You know, I've been told many times that music is the universal language. Well, I'm sure that it does approach it, certainly. But I think there's a much more universal language, and that is prayer. From the infant lisping phrases newly learned and not quite understood, to the old person dying on a bed of pain, with life's meaning now clearer before dimming eyes, there's a symphony for you, far and above mere man to comprehend. In such a symphony there are no scratchy fiddles, no untuned strings or broken reeds, just one vast harp, the harp of a thousand strings. Each voice of prayer is a voice in tune, for it is tuned to the infinite concertmaster who hears every pulsing string and throbbing note and every gentle rhythm and tender harmony. Now, every family of prayer is such a symphony, a mother, father, children, with voices raised to the almighty in daily family prayer. Yes, this is indeed music to his ears. Family theater again reminds you, the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed Follow Me, starring Phil Carey and featuring John Stevenson. Hildegard was your hostess. Others in our cast were Jack Crucian, Billy Bauckham, and Vic Perrin. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by Robert Hugh O'Sullivan, with music composed and conducted by Henry Mancini. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program by the Mutual Network, which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week when family theater will present The Penalty, starring Bobby Driscoll. Pat O'Brien will be your host. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America.